so here we're talking about mirrors and lenses and we're not going to focus too much on these notes simply because to get a really good understanding uh, requires more time than we have but I want to be able to talk about some things you know, like uh, how mirrors and lenses are used in real life. So to start off with, we have a few definitions. We have a thing called a plain mirror object and image. So plain mirrors are just your flat, regular old mirrors. That should be what you're very familiar with. Um, an object is the thing that you're looking at. So the object could make its own light, could be like a light bulb, or it could just be something that's reflecting light, you know, like your desk or your face. An image is a focused picture of the object. And we have to be very specific. It is a focused image. Because there's lots of things where like, oh yeah, the light's reflecting off of here or whatever. That's not a focused image, so it's not an image at all. So all images are focused. Do you have any questions about those definitions? Just like the image you're seeing on the screen, you can see these images just like you can see those. But the deal, the problem is, is if I said, hey, here's a meter stick, measure the size of that water faucet you see in this image. You can see that, right? But as soon as you start to try to measure it, can you physically put the meter stick on that image? No, you can put it on the mirror, but you can't put it on the image. And that's the problem, because the image appears to be, well, back here behind the mirror. Is there anything behind this mirror? No. And that's what makes a virtual image virtual, is you can see it. You can be like, oh, that's smaller than real life. But you can't do anything with it. And that's what makes it virtual. Like, it's not actually there. Make sense? Real. Yeah. Yeah. So real... You can interact with it almost like a real object. A virtual one, you can see, but you can't do anything with it. And so the projector here makes a real image, and that uh, mirror there, that convex mirror, makes a virtual image. Okay, we'll talk about that. And in these notes, I kind of go back and forth between lenses and mirrors, because they're really doing basically the same thing, except, you know, mirrors reflect where lenses pass through, but they give us the same uh, properties. So we start off with a nice, easy thing when we're talking about plain mirrors. So these are just, you know, like the mirror you typically look at yourself in. And the way a mirror works is if you, let's say, are standing in front of this mirror, you can see your whole image. Okay? So if this is a plain mirror, it's a virtual image, you're not actually behind the mirror. Um, and so what's interesting here is if this person's standing here like this, in order for you to see your feet, in order for you to see your feet, the light has to reflect off of your feet, bounce to the mirror, and then into your eyes. That's what this is showing. 
the eyes are getting this light ray, and it appears to be coming from, well, this spot over here where the image is being pulled. Do you all see that? So the light is physically doing this.
So, if you have an image that's formed by a lens like that, it, if it's a real image, it can be projected. So here I have a pair of glasses. Do you all see my pair of glasses here? These are not prescription glasses. These are just some of those like magnifying reading glasses. They're just like little lenses like that. We, we would call them convex lenses. And so they just magnify stuff. And so what's interesting is we have light coming into the window, yes? And this light is coming in, and even if I turn off the lights in the room, there's light coming in. Do you all see that the light is lighting up this board here? Well, the light's coming in, and it's spreading out in all directions. Now, we can tell that it's spreading out in all directions because if I'm sitting over here, I can see out that window. Or if I'm sitting over here, I can still see out that window. Does that make sense? Because the light's spread out. But if I take this um, lens here, so it's just like the one on the slide, it will focus the light, and I can make a real image. But it shows that that image will be what? It'll be upside down. But real images can be projected. So, I don't want these lenses here. Do you see my image? There's, there's actually two because there's two windows. Like that, this one, hard to see. Here. This one is that window over there. Depends on the prescription. Um, it depends on why you have the glasses. So see if your glasses do. Get closer. No, it doesn't work. And that's because you have, th these are converging lenses, and you probably have diverging lenses, which is much more common. My lenses are diverging as well. Um, now, we'll talk about glasses here towards the end, and I'll show you kind of the differences because like this, these are capable of doing it essentially because it's a magnifying glass. Most people don't need a magnifying glass. That's not why you need glasses. Some people do. So <clears throat> we'll talk about that as we get there. But I just wanted to show you that like that image you guys saw was on the board. It was projected onto the board because it was a real image. Everyone okay with that? And the virtual image, that means I can look through the lens and see it, but I can't do anything with it. A blank image can be projected on a screen. Real. Real image can be projected on a screen. Yes. Now the virtual image you can see, you just can't do anything with it. Depends on how you reflect it. Like if you just had like a flat mirror here and just held it up so you could see this thing in there, that would be a virtual image. Wait, so this is a real image? This is a real image. Okay. You see? Like the projector makes a real image. Like that mirror over there, that everything in that big fat mirror is virtual. Yeah. I mean, you can see it. And it's funny because people will be like, I'll be like, oh, measure this kid's height. And they'll just start measuring their height. And I'm like, no, I meant in the mirror. And they'll just be over here measuring it. And it's like, but that's what their height is in real life. Yeah. But what's their height in the mirror? And you and can't. Object. Yeah, you can't. Yeah, and that's that's why I say it's like if, like I can give you a meter stick and you can measure this thing. Like it's right here. But um, you you know like those things in that mirror you can see them, but you can't interact. With them. Okay. So mirrors and reflections. So whenever something reflects, the angle of incidence always equals the angle of reflection. But sometimes you get a nice, clear reflection from like a mirror. But sometimes you get reflections that aren't clear. For instance, this projector is making this image on this board. Do y'all notice that this mark board is kind of shiny? Matter of fact, if you look down on the floor, do y'all see the image? It's not the image, but do you see the light from the screen on the floor here? So the light is hitting the board and scattering in all directions. Okay, but some of it is hitting and then going, you know, it's trying to act like a mirror on the floor. Is this thing on the floor focused? No, so it's not an image. It's brighter. And so that means a lot of light is hitting this and going down to the floor. That's fine. But what's happening here is that this board is not a mirror. You all notice that? It's not a mirror. And it's not a mirror because it does what we call a diffuse reflection. All right? So a specular reflection is what a mirror does. That means everything comes in and then bounces out all together coherently. Well, when you have something that undergoes a diffuse reflection, that means it comes in and it bounces off. The angle of incidence only 
surface is not flat. And that's interesting because if you look at this board, this board looks pretty flat, doesn't it? Yeah. Right? Like your desk, that looks pretty flat, pretty smooth, like you can write your hand across it. You're like, that's smooth, right? Mm -hmm. But here's the thing is it smooth to light? Probably. No. And that's the difference between, say, a mirror and this board here. And they're both smooth enough for us when we touch them. But like a mirror is smooth at the size of light. So think about it like this. If you think about this floor here, if I took a ball and threw it down on the floor, it's going to bounce. Angle in, angle out. It's going to be very predictable, right? You can have a friend over there, and you can just throw the ball, bounce it on the floor to them. Not an issue, right? But if the floor was covered in gravel or like a bunch of rocks, and you throw that ball down, it might bounce right, but it really depends on how it hits the floor, right? The diamond is what? Um, yeah, it could, and if it, if it mostly reflects light, then yeah, it could act like a mirror. And really, how much it reflects really depends on the angle it hits at, but yeah, it could act like a mirror. And so that's that's kind of like what's happening here. Like this thing is pretty shiny and smooth, and you're getting a pretty good reflection. Like I mean, I can see like this red blob here. It should be that. I mean, I can't possibly read these words, but that's pretty close. And that's because this is pretty smooth. But in the end, do I want this board to be a mirror? No, because the whole reason why you guys can see this is the light comes in and it hits the board, but then it scatters in all directions. And that's very important because no matter where you're sitting in this room, you should be able to read this. Right? If this was a mirror, it would just go, it would just all be down there on the floor. And if you imagine something like your notebook paper, that feels pretty smooth. But it doesn't do a specular reflection because if it did, then you can only read your, your uh, lab notebook from a certain angle. Which would be a candid light. So, <coughs> essentially it's like, it, whether it gives us a specular or diffuse reflection depends on how it looks compared to light. Here's the fun fact about paper. You know how to make paper? How to make paper? Um, we get like. Start with a tree. Yeah, So that's what paper is. It's just like you took a tree, ground it up into pulp, laid it out with some glue, and it's stuck together. And when you realize it's literally just a bunch of fibers just like mooshed together, that's not that's not really smooth at all. Like it's smooth to us, but for light, no, that thing is not smooth and it just bounces off all randomly, which is why you can read it from any angle, right? Which is nice, because it, again, if it acted like a mirror. <laughs> you have to get different writing utensils. So here, this talks about lenses and mirrors um, in particular. And so this is a convex lens here. A lot of times I won't say convex lens, I'll just say converging lens, because you see how the light comes through it and converges to a point? So this is a converging lens here. Converging lenses can make real or virtual images. And whether or not it makes a real or virtual image depends on how close you are to the lens. Or how close the object is to the lens. Um, then on the other side here we have what's called a concave lens, or what Ollie will call a diverging lens. Because as the light passes through it, the uh, light beams get spread out more. Okay? And so earlier you asked the question about glasses. Well, your glasses could essentially be one or the other type of lens. And since you have two eyes, each eye could have its own problems. And so they could have different lenses for each eye. You might. I know I do. Uh, but mine aren't this different. But that magnifying glass, those glasses I had before are essentially like this. This uh, convex or converging lens. Where the light comes through and will go to a point. Um, most people, when they have glasses, they have the diverging lens that's over here on the other side because, well, they just need 
guys first, and then we'll talk about lenders. Not the normal one? Well, essentially, your eyes would focus the light too soon, or sorry, not soon enough. And as a result, you just need to focus a little bit further back on your eyeball. So typically, those are people that we would call nearsighted, or people that have trouble seeing things that are close to them. Which most people see things close to them fine. It's the farther away stuff. But again, a lot of that has to do with you know your genetics and also what was happening to you in the womb. You know, if you came out a little early, well, your eyes are definitely going to be a little bit more messed up. <laughs> and if you happen to be twins, well, typically twins come out early anyway. So. I, I had that, I think, because when she, I think it's only around, um, she gets off the same time. Yeah. Right. So here, now we have um, mirrors, and you, we have a concave and a convex mirror, but again, I'm, I'm really going to call them by their light rays. And so this one on the left here is again still a converging, but this is a converging mirror. And this mirror over here on the uh, other side, on the right side, is a diverging mirror. And so, well, I think I've skipped something. Move it back. So here, the convex lens, the one on the left is a uh, converging lens. Is everybody with me? Converging lenses can make both real and virtual images. The image just really depends on where the object is. Over here, this diverging lens only makes virtual images. That's it. Now that we're talking about mirrors, this one here where we have the converging mirror can make both real and virtual images. The diverging mirror can only make virtual images. So, let me show you guys what that looks like. So here, this mirror, this is a diverging mirror. It only makes one type of image. And so as I'm walking around the room here, this, these images, you'll notice, are all the same. They're, anything you're looking at this mirror is always right side up. It doesn't matter how close or far I get it from you. The images are always right side up. They're always virtual, and they're always smaller than what the actual object is. You all see that? Now here's the deal. On your cars, you have essentially three mirrors. Where are the three mirrors? Rear view mirror. Rear view mirror. Yeah, the two sides, right? One of those three mirrors usually has a thing written on it. What is it usually written on? Objects in the mirror are closer than they appear. What does that mean? Honestly, when I saw that, when I started driving, I was like, well, why would they give me a mirror that sucks? Why can't you just give me a normal mirror? Objects in the mirror are closer than they appear. That's because that mirror is like this. It is a convex mirror. That means it's a diverging mirror, which means that the images formed are always smaller than in real life. That's why it's written on there to remind you that these objects are closer because we tend to think, oh, if it's smaller, it's further away. But on that one, it's bent, the mirror is bent, to give you a larger field of vision. Huh? Yeah, it's, it's a little like a fisheye, because it gives you more of an, a greater field of view, so you can see more of what's going on. But because it gives you a greater field of view, the images are small. Okay? And so that's what they're trying to remind you. They're trying to tell you, hey, these things aren't really that far away. We just made them smaller so you can see more of what's going on. Which mirror has that written on there? The what? I know, but which mirror physically on your car has that written? Which side one? The driver's Not the driver's side. It's on the passenger side. It could be on the driver's side. And the thing is, is if you look at it, like some people have, like, you know, if you're driving like a big truck or something, you'll have like two mirrors. One will just be a flat plane mirror, and then one will be a curved mirror like this, like the convex mirror here, to give you a greater field of vision. So they're totally capable of being on both sides. But 
and generally, if you have two mirrors like that, they don't have them labeled because I think it's obvious that's what's happening there. But if you just have like the one mirror, usually the passenger side one, is bent a little bit to give you a greater field of vision. And the reason why it's the passenger side one is because you're not on the passenger side. If you're driving, that's going to be the mirror farthest away from you. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so they want you to be able to see a little bit more because, you know, when you're on the driver's side, if you want to see a little bit more, you can just kind of turn your head and you can see. But even if you turn your head to the passenger side, there might be passengers between you and that side, and then you can't see through them. So <coughs> let's look at a concave mirror. Though. So I, I showed you the convex mirrors, but I said concave mirrors can do both real and virtual images. And whether or not it forms a real or virtual image depends on how far you are from the mirror. You all see my mirror here? Pretty much all of the objects that you're able to see in this mirror are far enough away that they're going to form a virtual image. Okay? But this virtual image will be upside down, and it might be bigger or smaller than it should be, because it really depends on what the object is. But I can make it form a real image. I can make it flip right side up. But you have to get inside the focal point. So to do that, I'm going to shove this mirror in your face. See? <laughs> <laughs> now, some of you have a mirror like this. Yeah, it's like a makeup mirror. What's really funny is that when I was a kid, my sister had a makeup mirror, and she would use it, and like occasionally, like I would comb my hair. And I would ask my sister to borrow her mirror, and she's like, sure. And I would look at a mirror like this, and I didn't understand how she used it. I was like, how do you use this? Do you see how it flips over? Yeah. But again, it's capable of forming both a real and virtual image. It just depends on where the object is. And so I'll just leave this one out here. And so like I could just stick my hand here and go. There. That's nice. Right side up. But that was one of the things I didn't understand is I was trying to use her magic to make up here. And like if I was far enough away, it just looked like a blurry mess. So it wasn't forming an image. So I had to like, I didn't realize I had to get like this close in order for it to work. All right, so there's a couple of different types of defects for a, what's up? You need me to go back? No, it's good. Okay. So there's a couple of types of defects that happen with lenses and mirrors. Um, Again, flat lenses or flat mirrors, you're not going to get these things. It's only when they're curved. And if you make it like it's part of a sphere, like a spherical mirror, that's or spherical lens, that's where you get these problems. Because we have spherical aberrations and chromatic aberrations. Spherical aberrations happen when you make a mirror or lens out of like a part of a sphere. It turns out that the light towards the edges focuses less at a point than the light um, in the center. So the easiest way to fix that is, well, don't make a spherical lens or mirror. Make it a parabolic lens or mirror. But it turns out making parabolas is kind of hard. So a lot of times what they do <coughs> is for a lens or a mirror that's curved, and they want to take, a say, a picture from it, is we just don't use the light from the edges of the lens or mirror. So if you think about a camera, like a camera with a nice big fat lens on it, the camera shutter is designed to open and close in the center, right? And the reason why they want to open and close in the center is because the, the thing that opens and closes, that's the shutter, but just beyond that, we'll have a thing called the aperture. And the aperture inside of your camera will actually block the light from the edges of your lens. Because the light that goes to the edges will have one of two issues, either spherical aberration or chromatic aberration. And so it turns out it's a lot easier to make a bigger lens if we simply just block that edge light and so we don't have to deal with either of these errors. But here's the deal. Y'all ever taken a picture of something? <laughs> nope. You teenagers never take a picture. 
website. What is Instagram? No, but the whole deal is, you ever taken a picture, you ever had your picture taken like professionally? You ever notice that those pictures look a little better than your pictures? Mm -hmm. And by better, I don't mean they necessarily captured your good side, but like the actual image quality is like really good. And the reason for that is, is they have a bigger lens. That's actually why you're starting to see so many camera phones that have like two, three, five lenses on it. Because the thing is, is a bigger lens takes in more light. That's what makes the image better. It has nothing to do with who, obviously if somebody actually knows how to take a picture, they can do a lot of things. And that's essentially what's happening with your cell phone cameras, is that we have a lot of uh, software that's coming in and doing a lot of things, but it's very difficult, even with all the software, to, for them to make a really decent image, simply because your, your phone doesn't have a lens that's big enough. What I think is really funny is, like, several years ago, the iPhone had a commercial bragging about it, I mean, they do it occasionally, but it was bragging about how, like, oh, all of these images were filmed on an iPhone. That was true. They filmed like the whole commercial using an iPhone. However, what they didn't tell you was they also added a really big fat lens to it, which you can do. You can get a like essentially a case for your phone that you can attach like a professional size lens to, and it will take fantastic uh, video and you know regular still shots. But what's the problem? With It's not the lens that comes with the phone, and you can't put that in your pocket. And because that's the whole deal, that's why we use them so often. Because you, your camera's right here; it's, it's right there in your pocket. But it's it's interesting because you can really increase uh, the the visual clarity by simply having a larger lens, and that's simply because it's capable of taking in more light. But again, as the lens gets bigger, you're going to have more edge problems. So we always have the aperture there block these things. So spherical aberrations are where the lens doesn't quite focus at the edges. Chromatic aberrations is another focusing problem, but it's actually caused by, well, the light that we see are all different wavelengths, and they won't all exactly focus in the same spot because of refraction. Because again, with refraction, it's the bending of a wave, and how much a wave bends depends on its wavelength, and because they're all different colors, they all have different wavelengths. So again, we can fix this, but again, trying to take out the edge of the lens and not dealing with that. But it's just all the Okay. Yep. All of this we just do one test over. Yeah. Because we, we could have had a quiz, but essentially we would have had the quiz today and then the test next class that seems time to test it. So we're just gonna skip having a quiz. Mirages, we've talked about mirages before. But just to reemphasize, um, mirages are caused by the light bending or refracting because it's changing speed. And in air, the speed depends on, on the temperature of that medium. And so here you can actually see um, a nice mirage, and it's, it's explained pretty well. Like essentially what's happening in this picture here is the sun is behind you, and the sun is throwing down this light. It's reflecting off of all the stuff in front of you back to your eye. And so for the sky, we talk about how the light will hit this patch of sky and scatter. So essentially, if you're not looking at the sun, the sky looks blue because the light hit it, scattered off into your eyes. We talked about that. But because the road is so hot, it's going to change or refract the light coming through it. And so the sky is scattering light in all directions. So some of that skylight should have gone straight down and hit the road. But because it's hotter there, that light will be bent right here. You can see like this beam of light is ending up getting bent by the heat coming off the road. And so we see this blue stuff on the road and what do we naturally assume how blue stuff is? Yeah, we, we think it's water. But I think it's pretty clear from this picture here, like that's just the sky. Like, that is exactly the same color. And so it, it's a mirage. And you can see another mirage down there but again, it happens at a very specific angle, right? And as you try to walk towards it, it's not actually there. It'll say the 
Marais was, you know, could, everything's flat, but Marais will say the same distance. Here we're talking about total internal reflection and on the next slide we're talking about the critical angle. And we've talked about these things before. And if you want to see, you know, a demo of this, well that's what we were talking about last class. Um, so there's a link in the uh, description of the demos last class. We have total internal reflection. But what this is, is whenever the light goes from, or a wave, it goes from more dense to less dense for light, um, there's going to be a point at which the light hits the side and doesn't refract out anymore. It just stays in and reflects. This is called total internal reflection, where it just bounces around inside of your medium. And this is what makes fiber optic cables work. Okay. Because when you shine a light through fiber optic cables, the light will stay in them regardless of how much you bend it. But you have to shine it in at the very end or the edge of the cable. If you shine it in from the side, it won't stay. So, this slide here really explains what we call the critical angle, but also total internal reflection. So if you look at this bottom picture here, it shows like this light source. So imagine, if you will, you have a bathtub, like a big white bathtub, and you fill it up pretty close to the top with water. Okay? If you get in that bathtub, you're just sitting there, and you have a flashlight, let's assume it's a waterproof flashlight. If you push that flashlight down at the bottom of the bathtub and turn it on, the light will come straight out okay? at zero degrees like it shows in this picture. Everybody okay with that? That shouldn't be a surprise. But what's interesting is if you take that flashlight and start to turn it, this is what will happen. That as you start to turn, let's say you come in at like 20 degrees here, it will refract or bend as the light comes out, right? And so it's bending away from the normal. So like 20 becomes like 27, or then it shows like 30 becomes 42. And so it's bending away from the normal, but you run into this problem that, you know, like 40 becomes 59. When you have more angles on the bottom than you have on the top. And there's a point at which we reach what's called the critical angle. And the critical angle is where you put it in at just the right angle, that it doesn't come out, it bends, it refracts at 90 degrees. Okay? And so for the our example of being in water and a light going from water to air, that critical angle is 48.8 degrees. But literally at 48.8 degrees, instead of it bending and coming out, it will bend at 90 degrees and stay in the wall. Okay? So anything larger than that angle, like here it shows an angle of 60, which is bigger than 48.8, the light will go up, hit the surface of the water, and then reflect down just like a mirror. No light will come out. And that is the critical angle. And if you were to do that in your bathroom, even without any measurements, if you just take this flashlight and just turn it, at some point the light will hit the surface, reflect down, and then it will hit the bottom of the tub, and the tub acts like a diffuse reflector, and it will just light up the entire inside of the tub. Because it will hit that, and hit the tub, and then get scattered all around. And so that's what we're talking about here. That's the critical angle as, at which it turns into 90. So anything, any light greater than the critical angle will not come out will stay inside and undergo total internal reflection, which is what the last slide was talking about. And so if you send something at greater than the critical angle, it will stay inside. So interestingly, y'all talked about diamonds earlier. <coughs> For diamonds, if we had the same example here where we had air on top, diamond on bottom, the critical angle for diamond is one of the lowest known. Its critical angle is 24.4. Which means that most of the light, once it gets into the diamond, has trouble getting out. But the light will go into the diamond, bounce around, eventually it will come out. But the more bounces it makes, it makes it seem shiny and sparkly. That's why people like diamonds for rings, because they shine and sparkle more than, well, almost anything else. Now some of that has to do with how the sides are cut, because again, we want this, uh, we want the light to bounce at something greater than the critical angle, but just being the fact that the critical angle is 24.4 degrees, let's just say there's more angles between 24 and 90 than there are between 24 and zero. 
So the odds of the light staying in are much greater for a diamond. Everybody okay with that? All right, humid eyeball. We're getting to the end here. So, human eyes, uh, this is not a biology class, but human eyes have these parts. That they are. I'm not going to test you over them. I'm not requiring you to know these things. But you do have eyes. Um, so you may want to know some things. In general, a very hand wavy explanation of how your eyes work is light comes in, uh, we'll say through the lens, this thing in the middle, your pupil allows the light to come in. What's interesting is that we have an aperture, we talked about that, around your camera that doesn't allow light to go through the edges of your lens. You guys have a, a the cornea, not the cornea, the uh, pupil, that's the dark area, and you've got the iris around your eye that acts like your aperture that opens and closes and lets in more or less light. But your aperture there, your, uh, I just said it, not the iris, the uh, cornea, yes. That the colored part of your eye will always block the edge of the lens to not allow, well, chromatic and spherical aberration to go in there. Now this lens is a converging lens that's in your eye, so it wants to focus the light on the back of your eye, or on the retina. And the retina has those rods and cone cells that we talked about before. And so you want it to be focused there so that your eyes can pick up the focused light. Now what's interesting here is a couple of things. First of all, your lens is not solid as like you think of like a you know, magnifying glass lens. It is capable of changing shape, which is why your eyes can see things at different distances. And so your muscles in your eye will, you know, force your lens to change shape. Now, when you're born, because of you know, genetics or just what happened to you in the womb, your eyes could be not completely uh, shaped correctly. Your, well, your eyes, yes, but also the lens. And so a lot of times as people get um, laser eye surgery, they just go in and they kind of shave off a little bit on the lens to make it focus correctly, right? Um, so what's interesting here is the light comes through the lens and should focus on the back of your uh, eyeball or at the retina there. And, you know, there's a bunch of you know, parts here I'm not going to get into. But that's, that's generally how your eyes work, is that the, uh, the light needs to be focused on the back of your eyeball. Fun fact, the light, when it comes through a lens like this, is flipped upside down. Did y'all notice that when I showed the uh, light from the windows on the board? This, that was upside down, right? Because when light goes through a lens like this, it's upside down. So the image that's forming on your eyes, on the back of your eyes right now, is upside down. Does it look upside down to you? No, because your brain flips that image over. And I do mean that your brain flips that image over. There was an experiment done, it's been done a couple of times, where people put on essentially lenses, and if you look through lenses like this, the image will be upside down, like a magnifying glass. So they essentially had lenses made that fit right on their face. It didn't let any light, because you know, glasses, you can still see around the edges. These were more like goggles. Like, they were stuck to their face and they couldn't see anything that didn't come through the lens, okay? And everything was upside down. And the experiment was, well, if your brain is simply flipping this image over, can your brain do it again? Well, it turns out that the people who did this experiment, or have done the experiment, it didn't happen overnight. Like they had to wear it for four to five days. And literally, like on the fifth day, they would wake up, everything would be upright. Cool. Um, I don't, it was a long time ago, but I watched a documentary on YouTube and this little girl who, like, that her, her brain did it, so it was like, um, upright. So everything was upside down, she had to read her book like this, going. <laughs> well, and that's, that's just it. And, but the whole point of the experiment is to prove that it's our brains doing it. And if your brain has an issue that doesn't do it, well then, that's an issue, right? And so what's interesting about this experiment is that these people wore those goggles long enough that their brains flipped it over. But that's the interesting part. Because now everything looks right side up. Everything's fine except for one problem. They're wearing these goggles. So 
And then after a couple of days, they took the goggles off. And everything was upside down. <laughs> and it, it turns out it only took another day or two for it to turn back to normal. But the fact is, is that's what proves that A, images form in our eyes just like they form in these lenses that we can see. Obviously, we don't have to experiment on our eyes the whole time. But it is our brain that is flipping the image over. Okay. And I don't think I would volunteer for that experiment, but there's video from like the experiment and like, you know, these people that are wearing these goggles while it's upside down, they can't do a whole lot. Because it's like, they can't drive to work. They can't, like, it, it's funny because like in the video, like the guy like tries to like pour himself like a glass of milk and it's just like. Because <laughs> he can't, like everything is messed up because it's upside down and you're trying to compensate. It's just like, no. And so, like, they had to have people basically help them with everything. Um, except for, you know, like, you don't need help brushing your teeth because as much as you look in the mirror, do you actually need the mirror to brush your teeth? No. And so that's the thing. Anything that you had to, like, look at, it was just like, okay, I'm going to get dressed now. That works. But it's just, you know, I'm trying to cut my food. Uh, it's a little hard. And so th that's just an interesting thing. So, vision defects, okay? So here's the deal. There's two basic vision problems. There's other vision problems, okay? Um, but the two basic ones are myopia and hyperopia. So myopia, sometimes called nearsightedness, looks like this up here. So the light comes through your lens and gets focused, but it's focused, well, in front of the retina. You all see that? And so the stuff that your retina picks up is back here, which means the light went through but now it's no longer focused, it's no longer an image, okay? And we can fix this with a diverging lens, okay? And that's why I said that's what most people have. Um, now, hyperopia is farsightedness because it focuses well, behind the retina there. It's too far. And so we can focus that with the converging lens to make it focus there. And that's the whole deal of what your optometrist is doing, is they're trying to figure out what, how much okay, you need a diverging, converging lens, but not just any diverging lens works, right? It depends on how far off this image is. And they, you know, they literally are just experimenting on images, number one, number two, number five, number two. Because they're trying to figure out where to get it, and they'll, you know, they know how to write the prescription so that when, they, when somebody manufactures the lens for you, it will be of the correct size to do what is needed. Now, what's interesting here is that it says myopia is nearsighted, hyperopia is farsighted. And it's literally based on where the image is formed. But if you actually read the definition of myopia, it says a nearsighted person cannot see distant objects. You can see close objects. It's the ones that are further away that you're going to have trouble focusing on. And the reason for this is because of if an object is far away, the light rays coming off of that are essentially parallel. Because like, if you think about the trees out there next to the street, the light from the sun is hitting the trees going off in all directions. But in order for you to see it, the light rays have to come a long distance. And if the light rays aren't parallel at this point, you wouldn't see them because they would have diverged. Does that make sense? And so nearsighted people have trouble with objects that are far away because all of these light rays are essentially parallel, and your eyes are having trouble focusing them. But an object that's close to you has light rays going off, in all directions, and so your eyes aren't dealing with parallel light rays anymore. They're dealing with light rays that are diverging, and so your eyes just have to converge the diverging ray. And so, you know, your eyes might be more capable of doing one or the other. So a nearsighted person, the objects near or close, they are in focus. A farsighted person can see objects that are focused far away that have trouble when they're close to you. What's interesting is that generally as people get older, um, they have more of this trouble with close objects. You ever try to show something to your parents on the phone? Like <laughs> yeah, and you're like, here you go, and you give it to them, and they're like, <laughs> yeah. they put it like an extra foot away from their face. Well, that's what's going on here. They're having trouble focusing on the uh, close images. And that's just because more or less their muscles and their eyes are wearing out. Um, <clears throat> so what's interesting about this is you can focus it. So here, I have those magnifying glasses. Well, actually, I'm just going to do this demo. 
But there's nothing else in the notes. I'm just going to end the video. Do you all have any other questions before I end this recording?